Carnegie Mellon Vaccination Database Talks are made possible by Ottertune. Learn how to automatically optimise your MySQL and Postgres configurations at ottertune.com. And by the Stephen Moy Foundation for keeping it real. Find out how best to keep it real at stephenmoyfoundation.org. Thanks for everyone coming uh, to another session for the uh, Vaccination Database Summer Series. Uh, today we're excited to have Marco Aslot uh, from CITUS, which is, was acquired by Microsoft in 2019. Uh, so Marco lives in the Netherlands, so right now it is, what, 10 p.m., 10.30 p.m. for you. Uh, so we appreciate you staying up late with us. Uh, he is a principal software engineer at Microsoft, where he leads the development of CITUS uh, as part of the Azure database uh, for Postgres Group. Um, Prior to that, he joined Citus in the early stages of the startup in 2014. Um, and he also has a PhD in self-driving cars, which this talk will not be about, uh, which is a whole nother, another, I guess, life for you. Um, and he has a uh, master's degree and undergraduate degree in computer systems from BU in Amsterdam. So again, we thank Marco for being here. As always, the way we'll do this is that if you have a question for Marco, please interrupt him at any time during the talk, unmute yourself, Ask, you know, say where you're coming from and ask your question. Okay, we want this to be interactive, so feel free to you know, again, stop them at any time. Okay, Marco, the floor is yours. Thank you for doing this. Go ahead. All right. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Very excited to talk to you. I mean, the uh, the lineup of this series of database talks is is super impressive. So uh, privileged, feel privileged to be here talking to you. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, the project I've been working on for pretty much the last seven years, which is uh, CITUS, which is an extension that uh, aims to turn Postgres into a distributed database. An extension that's like a Postgres terminology for plugin. So you just use the regular vanilla Postgres uh, binaries, and then you can install the extension on top. And the goal of an extension is to add uh, sort of new features to Postgres without actually changing the underlying uh, database code. And the two features that Citus adds are distributed tables and reference tables. And everything else we do is pretty much about making existing and new Postgres features work seamlessly with these two types of tables. And uh, the goal there is like Postgres has a lot of uh, versatility and it's, it's, that also actually makes it simple to use because pretty much anything you can come up with, any SQL query, it always just works. Um, and uh, we wanna kind of provide that versatility at scale such that you can use extensions, uh, things like PostGIS, uh, any type of index that Postgres has, uh, we wanna make that work on more than a single server. It also means we're trying to make Citus uh, multi-purpose. So we're both trying to scale transactional workloads through routing queries to the right worker node and uh, scale analytical workloads by adding uh, parallelism and also uh, columnar storage. So, so far we've done columnar storage via a separate extension, but we're now kind of uh, integrating that into Citus itself. So why be an extension uh, rather than uh, a fork, which is traditionally Postgres has been forked quite a lot. Uh, like a lot of projects have started with the Postgres code base because it has a very liberal license. It's it's quite easy to read, it's very well structured. Um, but uh, the problem is like, it just keeps going. So every year there's gonna be a new release packed with features, performance improvements, uh, new ways to extend the database and so on. And then uh, that also means that not only do you kind of have to keep up with that either by integrating those changes or by just saying, okay, we're gonna be older Postgres. Um, but there's also this vast ecosystem of tools and other extensions that uh, ultimately always converge to the new version of Postgres. So, you know, no one's gonna maintain their extension for your fork. So if you want to uh, continue taking advantage of that ecosystem, you have to kind of be an extension as well. Um, and so it, it's, it's been uh, very beneficial for us actually to make uh, CITUS an extension. So why, uh, why CITUS? Like why uh, essentially scale out Postgres or make Postgres distributed? Uh, well, obviously like Postgres is limited to a single server and that leads to a lot of different uh, capacity execution time issues. You can always have a pretty large database just by attaching a lot of disks. But you know, if your working set doesn't fit in memory, uh, what we see nowadays a lot in cloud environments, uh, you know, everyone uses like network attached storage, which uh, because it's replicated and encrypted, but then you have a limited number of IOPS that you can use on your server. 
a lot of operations in Postgres are actually either single threaded or do have parallelism, but it's not as uh, always as efficient or versatile as you'd like it to be. Um, and uh, also a common sort of Postgres specific problem, like because it uses MVCC, like an update uh, inserts a new row and then the, the other row is, uh, the old row is left in place. It needs to clean up, but also cleanup is a single threaded process, at least per table. It can do multiple tables in parallel, but per table it's single threaded. So sometimes it cannot keep up with your transactional workload. Everything gets bloated, all your queries get slower. And um, so this is like some typical problems you might experience if you put too much pressure on, on a single server. And, uh, but that's the Postgres centric view of, you know, why you might want to scale out. Uh, if you look at it from a different perspective of like other databases looking at Postgres, there are really a lot of uh, capabilities in Postgres that are actually hard to find, or it's hard to find all of them in other systems. Uh, and this includes like Postgres has a very versatile set of indexes, uh, expression index, covering indexes, partial indexes. Uh, there's geospatial extensions like PostGIS. Uh, there's of course just joins, functions, constraints, good JSON support, also updates. Um, and uh, there's a lot of data pro processing systems that have some of these, but not, not all of the ones you might want. Because sometimes also uh, a particular extension, like a particular sketch algorithm, or even something you built yourself, uh, can really make a huge performance difference for a lot of workloads. And so the only thing missing from this list is really uh, scale, like the ability to scale across uh, beyond a single server. So that's what we're, we're trying to add. Now, of course, not every workload that, uh, not every Postgres workloads can necessarily benefits from uh, the ability to scale. So there are a lot of like, uh, especially smaller scale OLTP workloads, which, uh, which maybe they're bottlenecked on lock contention. Maybe they have a lot of super complex stored procedures. In any case, they don't really benefit from scaling out. And similarly, there's a lot of workloads that benefit from scale out, but don't really have any business with Postgres. Like machine learning is not something that Postgres currently shines at. Um, so the, in this intersection, what we found over the years of developing Citus is that there's these four patterns that we see a lot in hey, terms Marco. of... So, so I agree with you. Transact processing, you may not always want to scale that out. But what, you said store procedures. Why would that be an issue? Um, well, it often it's not just specifically about stored procedures, but it often creates uh, a lot of dependencies between, uh, let's say, different tuples in the database that um, you know make it that every stored procedure essentially has to touch on every every single server in the cluster. Oh, it's, it's, uh, it's like, it's, it's, it's just like the TT problem, yeah. Right, right. Like, yeah, if you have distributed queries, distributed transactions. Right, right. And so it can also be just be a very complex, grow over time as well, so they just get more and more complex, so. Okay, that um, makes sense. So, um, what we've seen in this intersection of like, you know, Postgres and scale out is that there are certain kind of recurring workload patterns. Like we've talked to really like hundreds of companies, probably much more. And um, like some patterns we see a lot is like software as a service. Um, so where uh, you have a lot of, uh, like you have a web application or mobile app maybe as well. And you, uh, you have a lot of independent customers. And uh, with this kind of setup, it's very easy to add customers. So those businesses can grow quite quickly. And also because you have a lot of independent customers, something that happens is the, the working set can get quite large because you have like not, no real correlation between what different users are doing. And um, then also uh, these applications tend to have pretty complex data models, especially by the time they usually start thinking about scaling out, they have complex data models. But fortunately, because they're multi-tenant, we can kind of shard them by uh, by the tenant dimension. Um, so that also makes them quite like they need scale out, but they also can scale out. Um, another common workload pattern is real-time analytics. So there's these user-facing dashboards that maybe do thousands of queries, analytical queries per second. That's uh, touch upon a fairly large amount of data, um, which is not something. Uh, OLAP stores are generally pretty good at because they are good at you know scanning lots of data quickly, but then doing thousands of queries per second, uh, usually not so much. But then OLTP stores are usually don't have the 
parallelism and the scale. So there's this intersection where if you can do parallelism plus also having indexes uh, that, that helps you kind of serve these real-time analytics use cases. Actually, you also find things like updates are, are very important here that you can, uh, you often ingest like bad data that you might want to clean up later or you have to delete data, specific data for compliance reasons. Um, so that also kind of makes, makes Postgres quite, uh, quite useful there. Other uh, workloads, uh, I think for, with Citus, we focused a bit more on the first two because they were, while we were doing this, a bit more niche. Uh, the other two workloads, we've also just seen a lot, but we focused a bit less on, but also still can, can reasonably support them. One is the traditional NoSQL use case, so key value storage. Um, Postgres is quite popular for that type of workload as well, particularly because it has the quite good JSON support. But uh, one of the downsides it has, it's like if you start updating your JSON objects, you get an enormous amount of table bloat. So this is where this auto vacuum problem comes in. And the sharding there helps, helps a lot with that. And uh, finally, there's tradi more traditional OLAP uh, reporting use cases where you have a large amount of data and fairly complex uh, queries that you wanna answer ideally as quickly as possible, but it can easily take uh, minutes or sometimes hours, but preferably not days. So what's interesting about these different workload patterns is they kind of have a different, no very different notions of high performance and what it means to actually scale. So in analytical workloads, like things like parallelizing queries is very important, uh, but uh, it's, for example, for a multi-tenant workload, it's, it's useful, but it's not really essential. But then for a multi-tenant workload, it's very important that we can uh, root queries with very minimal overhead and actually also for support very complex queries uh, with very minimal overhead. So they, they have actually require quite different capabilities from the database and you know we can make a much uh, much longer list also looking at like existing Postgres capabilities including foreign keys. But uh, so we need to kind of somehow implement all these different things in Postgres. And so the question is how can we do that as an extension without changing any Postgres code. And uh, I guess Citus history sort of starts in, uh, in 1986 with uh, the second design goal of the Postgres database, uh, which was provide extendability for data types, operators, and access methods. So this was a um, really from the beginning, Postgres was designed to be extensible. Now, over time, as the Postgres, later PostgreSQL project uh, developed, um, a lot more, many more things were made extensible, including the planner, the executor, parts of the transaction manager. There's these foreign data wrappers for querying other databases. An extension can make a, a background worker, which is a background process that can do you know, some maintenance. Um, so, and, and sometimes this, um, and this, this was just a good compromise within the community, let's say one company, because Postgres is very much a community project. So if one co company wants to go left and another wants to go right, a simple solution is to put a, put a hook there and then they can both go in the direction that they want by building an extension. Um, and yeah, people also like, we've been at making Postgres more extensible and, and there's now even more than on this list, uh, things that you can alter as an extension. And so what is an extension? It's basically, well, it is actually a, uh, a native SQL object in, uh, in Postgres, like an extension is, is a, a thing you can create, but the extension consists of a, essentially a SQL file that can have tables, it can create tables and functions and types and well, whatever you can create in the database. And then optionally there's a shared library. So this is usually written in C and it has the implementations of the functions but um, as a C binary uh, that's loaded into Postgres, it can also modify any global variables, call any global functions. And so that's uh, how a lot of the uh, changing of, of the behavior is, is done. Uh, so you can basically an extension is a bit like a, a massive packaged hack almost, but uh, it, it gets loaded at, at runtime. So to set up a Citus cluster, uh, so you set up a bunch of Postgres servers and then you do uh, create extension Citus that creates the, the metadata tables and the functions. So after that, we can use those functions to 
uh, configure it so we can add the nodes, the, uh, the IP addresses, set up the authentication. Um, usually we, we start from, from one node, uh, the coordinator node, and then add these, uh, these worker nodes. There's also other setups. We're not really strictly tied to having a single coordinator. You can have the workers act as, as coordinators such that they'll be able to use, uh, respond to distributed queries as well. You can also have multiple coordinators. So there's some flexibility around the exact setup. But very often we find like for many workloads, a single coordinator is actually okay because uh, I mean, it only does really does query planning and some data transfer. Um, so you can scale up to pretty large sizes on, on a single coordinator. So which means that a typical production workload looks something like this, where uh, each node typically has a hot standby. So for things like high availability, we just rely on existing Postgres tools or kind of if we're building a managed service on uh, you know, the same thing we would do for just single server Postgres to do auto failover that if the primary fails in 30 seconds or so, fail over to a hot standby. Same for backups uh, at the server level, we uh, archive the write ahead logs into, into blob storage and, and make snapshots of the, of the disks. So for, uh, so Citus is mostly concerned with charting and less with uh, like high availability because there we, we, we have other tools. Um, and then we, in the single coordinator model, you, you just kind of connect to one IP, which also works a little better with most Postgres tools. So, uh, you know, when you have a load balancer, load balancing across multiple worker nodes, uh, you, you know, you might connect to one node, create a table and then reconnect and then the table is gone because now you're actually on a different server. So uh, also for simplicity, we usually recommend this setup. Now, uh, once you've set up Citus uh, to actually use it, uh, first thing you do is create a table. Now we don't change the default behavior of, of Postgres. So creating a table just means create a table on the coordinator on, on that Postgres server. And then uh, you call select create distributed table. So this calls one of the Citus functions and there you specify uh, the distribution column. And then the function goes and connects to the worker nodes and creates uh, the shards. And the shards are actually just regular Postgres tables on the worker node. So they can have indexes, constraints. Um, we don't seamlessly support triggers, but they can have triggers as well. Um, so whatever Postgres supports, uh, that you can have that on those tables. And um, we use hash partitioning. So each shard contains a uh, different range of hash values. And we also put multiple shards per worker node. And we do that for two reasons. One is um, we can then parallelize operations even uh, across multiple cores by querying multiple shards in parallel. And then that also works for operations like delete and update and create index, uh, which works a little better than the, the built-in parallelism in Postgres. And then the other reason is as the cluster grows, so we add more worker nodes, we can move the shards uh, using logical re replication without downtime. Um, and so that's that's the advantage of just being able to having multiple shards per worker nodes because then we can later move some data uh, away from it without downtime. And <clears throat> I mean, if at some point you run out of shards, it is possible to reshard, but that does in incur some downtime right now, but we'll probably resolve that in the future. Um, so there's uh, actually two table types like distributed tables and reference tables, and then also distributed tables can be co-located with each other. So if you don't specify anything, we'll actually try to auto co-locate based on the type of the distribution column. And co-location means that you know, the same hash range will be in the same place. And that means you can have foreign keys and on uh, the distribution column and also joins on the distribution column will just be executed locally uh, by joining the shards. And uh, if you need foreign keys or joins on a different columns, you can create reference tables. So those are replicated across uh, all the workers. And I mean, these are sort of obvious uh, features that you've seen and that you find in other distributed databases as well. But we do find them like, uh, I want to stress it because it's, they're actually super important for uh, scaling relational workloads and especially reference tables which are themselves sort of slow tables that you replicate everywhere. So they're also kind of inefficient in that way. But for example, they help you uh, normalize your data. If you're storing like really large volumes of something like uh, website hits, um, maybe you store the user agent string and maybe there's 
only so many user, user agent strings or user agent substrings. So maybe instead of storing them with every hit, you can store them in the reference table and just store an opaque identifier. So suddenly that can mean your column is like four bytes instead of a hundred bytes. And so at scale, that, that can matter a lot, especially in terms of, uh, in terms of the cost. So um, once you've created your distributed tables and reference tables, um, when you query the distributed table, what will happen is uh, Citus answers that query by sending queries to all the shards and then merging the response. So how can Citus uh, you know, change this behavior of Postgres? So here we're actually changing the query engine in some way. And um, the reason is that Postgres has all these uh, essentially function pointers declared as global variables for ex extensions to change. So the, this is actually almost literally copy pasted from uh, Postgres code, probably called planner.c, not postgres.c. But um, so the, the one thing that the main planner function in Postgres does, the function that gets called after parsing the query and building the AST is check if there's a planner hook set. If so, call the planner hook, otherwise go into the standard planner. And so what the Citus extension does is when the shared library gets loaded and you have to configure it to get loaded on startup, um, it sets the planner hook, which means that every query that gets planned by Postgres goes to the Citus planner hook. And uh, we can do anything there. Like we can make every query return hello world. We can make every query send out a tweet. Uh, but the nice thing to do is uh, look at the query. Are there any distributed tables there? If so, we go to Citus query planning. If not, we just call back into uh, the standard planner. So that way we preserve all the regular Postgres behavior and only do something special for distributed tables. So is that, is you, like, so you had to write your own query optimizer now, right? Because you're, you're operating on the AST, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So does that mean you have, is it cost-based or is it, is it heuristics? Like how comprehensive is the Citus query optimizer? So uh, the Citus query optimizer for the most part is, is pretty simple. Um, but I mean, I'll, I'll get to it in the next few slides and then I can. Okay. All right. Um, so the thing that the planner function needs to return is a, uh, a plan statement, which contains a, uh, a plan tree, which like Postgres has this volcano style executor where there's execution nodes and it asks the top level node for a tuple. And then that node can have child nodes, which it asks for a tuple. So it, it does need to return a valid Postgres plan, but the plan can contain custom scans. And so custom scans are how we hook into the executor. Um, like when uh, the custom scan gets called, it basically calls a custom Citus function which calls into a component we call the adaptive executor, whose job is basically to send queries to worker nodes and return the tuples that come back. And so the merging of the tuples that come back is done just by the Postgres executor by, uh, by this hash aggregate node in this case. So the actual optimizer um, organically over time, we've kind of ended up with this four stage uh, optimizer uh, maybe at the time it was more out of expediency to improve status for a particular workload. But at the time we realized our planners sort of match exactly those four workload patterns that we, uh, we discussed at the start that we're trying to, uh, trying to target. So one is like if the query is just very simple, the, it's like a select from table where distribution column equals something or delete or update or insert. Uh, what we'll do is we'll try to recognize those queries with minimal overhead um, and then construct a query which where we replace the table name with the shard name and send it to the worker nodes. Uh, next stage is what we call the router planner. Uh, the router planner can actually deal with arbitrary SQL queries. Anything that Postgres supports is also supported by the router planner as long as all the distributed tables in the query have the same distribution column filter. And it's somewhat clever about uh, inferring that if there's a join on the distribution column and there's a filter on one side, it can uh, infer that the other side has it as well. But because it, uh, it then knows, okay, this just goes to a single Postgres server, it can just take that query and send it to that uh, server. And it does this for deletes and updates uh, and inserts as well. Now, after that, uh, it means we have to go through uh, kind of merge data from, from uh, multiple shards. And then um, 
we kind of go through one more state. Well, at this point, we do construct a logical plan. So we convert the AST into uh, a logical plan that we optimize by applying uh, commutativity rules. So we figure out you know, how to split up aggregates, what we can push down and what we cannot push down. But one observation we had is, well, because we have these collocation and reference table features, uh, very often we it is either uh, organically or uh, intentionally, you can construct query trees which only have co-located joins. And we can actually parallelize those um, in a very efficient manner uh, and actually get back to that. Um, and if we cannot, if, if there's not a co-located join in the join tree, we go through kind of a join order planner where we decide uh, where we look at, uh, okay, well, we need to repartition this table to match that table. And then it, uh, it generates all the possible join orders uh, with like repartition operations or broadcast and picks the one that it expects to have the uh, least amount of network traffic. Now this part of Citus is um, because we have focused a bit more on the real-time analytics and the multi-tenant, we've not invested as much in uh, this part of the planner. Um, so there are some limitations there around like correlated subqueries. And also we're, we're actually not exceedingly clever about uh, cost here yet because we've not focused on that data warehousing uh, workload so much. Um, so that's, that's kind of in a way the answer to your question as well. Like we, we haven't uh, like our, our, the, the data warehousing part, part of site still needs some work, uh, let's say. Uh, one thing we're, we're looking at, so Postgres does also have like deeper hooks in the planner where you can kind of integrate into it, its cost-based optimizer. So you kind of propose paths to it that uh, it can pick between as, uh, and it can, it'll pick the lowest cost plan. So we're kind of looking at doing that in the future to um, make the data warehousing queries a little more optimized. So you don't even go through like the Postgres free writer step. Like there's that, there's that one part of the code where it's like a bunch of if then else's, uh, and then you get to the cost-based search. Uh, you, you're 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 intercepting before you even get to that rerouter phase. Right. Yes. So I mean, okay. we, we okay. basically overtake the whole planner. Uh, Got it. So, yeah. Uh, we basically built like uh, do the optimization from scratch. And then what do you then you send to the nodes? You're sending SQL or you're sending the AST? Uh, we're sending SQL. All right. So all right. So then and then on the node, then they can get through all that like those like you know one equals two converts the false like. All that is handled on the individual nodes. Okay, that makes sense. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So, yeah. yeah, one of the interesting ones here is like this, uh, this query pushdown optimizer. So when there's this co-located join, so you can have pretty complex queries in the middle here. Uh, we, don't, we don't even really care what's there. The only thing we care about, is there a co-located join between the distribution columns? It could also be reference tables. And then, I mean, there's certain other restrictions on the subqueries. But as, as long as those conditions are met, we can just treat this pretty much as a table because we'll send SQL to the worker nodes. So uh, we'll just take whatever's in here, replace the table names with the shard names and send that to the worker nodes. And then we only have to uh, optimize what remains of the query, which is relatively straightforward. Um, like we <coughs> you know, push down partial aggregates to the, to the workers. And so, um, so here's the, here it would be an example plan where or execution rather, where uh, we have a tree that, that merges the result, but then most of the, the query actually just gets pushed down to the worker and the worker can use whatever uh, facilities it has for answering this query efficiently, like whether it's indexes or partitioning to do time filters, uh, et cetera. So we leave a lot of the, uh, the heavy lifting that, that let's say to, uh, to Postgres. Um, also, we do some like before we get to query pushdown planning, we try to just uh, catch like subqueries that we can easily, uh, well, we already know how those are gonna be planned anyway. Like we'll have to merge stuff on the coordinator and broadcast the result. So we try to uh, upfront take those out and create subplans for those and then change the query tree to read the result of the subplan because then we can actually also treat the, the main query as something that's pushdownable. Uh, and basically we'll, the sub plan uh, will get executed, but the results will not get pulled up, but will get pushed into the cluster uh, or broadcast into the cluster. And then we can join the shards with the intermediate result that uh, was created here. 
And we also have some other ways of doing subplans like uh, repartitioning. Um, but this also makes the query pushdown planner a little more effective because we can uh, make a lot more things go through query pushdown. Um, so there's a lot more to be said about the planner, especially, I mean, especially the join order planner, but um, I don't think Citus does anything unusual there. Um, and there's, there's still work to be done. Um, so I wanna talk a bit more about uh, transactions. And um, again, there's, uh, there's a set of hooks that we have uh, or callbacks that we can set. In particular, there's a pre-commit, post-commit and a board callback, some other ones around sub-transactions. And so if we're dealing with a transaction that only touched on a single node, uh, we'll pretty much just delegate the decision to the, the worker node. So in, I think in the pre-commit hook, we'll send the commit command to the worker node and then you know, it decides whether it commits or crashes. Or, um, so single node transactions are, are, are fairly straightforward. Um, then transactions across multiple nodes uh, use the built-in to PC infrastructure in Postgres. So you, we have the possibility of preparing a transaction so in that case, um, I mean, the, the, like we're no longer in a transaction block, but all the locks that the transaction has get preserved even across restarts or failover. And, um, and then later we can commit that transaction or, or, or roll back. Um, so that's the infrastructure that Postgres has. It doesn't implement the, a full two PC protocol. So we, we do that. But so basically in the, in the pre-commit hook would send these prepare transaction commands and then post-commit we'd send commit prepare to where if anything goes wrong, we'll send uh, rollback prepare. And um, then of course, like what if the commit prepared fails or, or what if we leave a stray uh, prepared transaction? So there we use this background inf worker infrastructure. So we have a background worker um, uh, that periodically compares uh, the prepare transactions on the worker to a local log of commit records. So the coordinator, just before it commits a 2PC, um, it writes a several records or records for each of the prepared transaction into a local table. And then uh, if it actually commits, then those records will become visible. So that's how the background worker can then determine, oh, I see a prepared transaction on that worker and I have a record for it uh, in my local log. So that should have committed. Uh, or if there's no record, it, I guess the coordinator reported, so it should be uh, rolled back. Um, and you know, okay, there might also be records that uh, have already been committed, so then it can just delete the record. So um, <clears throat> that's that's how the the two PC recovery is done. So that uh, as long as you have like a replication, also the commit log is replicated, so we can uh, survive failures as well. Um, the other thing we need to do is deadlock detection. So we don't use something like wound wait to prevent deadlocks. The reason is like most Postgres clients expect Postgres to be in read committed mode, which means transactions aren't expected to restart. So like they'll just treat restart as failure. And um, we also cannot easily restart transactions internally, uh, which is necessary for wound wait because um, the Postgres protocol is interactive. So uh, if you send a begin and then an update, you'll already get uh, some result from that update, like how many rows were updated. And then if uh, you get into a point where you have to restart the transaction, uh, you cannot go back because you already told the application you updated two rows. And the second time the transaction runs, it may, not, it may update three rows. So then the application might behave differently. So um, yeah, given that we cannot use wound wait, uh, we kind of just do deadlock detection. And that means we, every two seconds, the background worker that does 2PC recovery also every two seconds, it asks all the worker nodes for their uh, lock graphs. And because when we open a transaction block on the workers, we call uh, this assigned distributed transaction ID UDF, which tells the worker, hey, this local transaction is part of this bigger distributed transaction. And then that is returned by the, the local weight etches function. So then we can build a global gra lock graph of the distributed transactions. And if there's a cycle, we'll, uh, we'll cancel one of them until the cycle, or we'll keep canceling until the cycle is gone. And cancellation is just local SIGINT. Um, and so every coordinator does this for itself. So if there are multiple coordinator, it does its own 2PC recovery and its own deadlock detection. We don't um, have anything uh, we don't have distributed snapshot isolation. So if you have a concurrent query 
uh, it might see a transaction being committed on one node and, and not yet committed on another node. Um, there's kind of two reasons for that. One is the snapshot manager is one of the few pieces of Postgres that is not very extensible. Um, the other reason why we haven't really changed that yet is that within the workload patterns we target, it hasn't really been an issue. Like for multi-tenant workloads, they tend to uh, just have transactions going to a single machine. So you just get the Postgres guarantees, uh, same for CRUD workloads. And then for analytical workloads, you usually have different concern, especially like real-time analytics workloads. They tend to have noisy missing data anyway, so it doesn't really come up. So basically we haven't really had a customer come to us say, oh, I have this problem or, or I really need this. So that's the other reason, but it, it would also require some changes to Postgres. Right, so, so you said that your customers are running recommitted by default with the default isolation level. And for that reason, you can't win, use win and wait. Uh, I don't yeah, know, so but how, other, how's that different than deadlock detection? Like if my transaction gets imported, uh, I don't care so, whether it was. Yeah, we wouldn't wait. Uh, a transaction might have to restart um, because, like, if if you're, you're waiting yeah. for a lock with uh, a process with it's high priority, you yeah. have to like. But how's that different started. than deadlock detection? Like, I have a deadlock. Right. I got I got I got a board in. Uh, well, like if there if there's an actual deadlock, there's no way forward anyway. So we might as well uh, stop. And well, with deadlock detection, you can uh, it, it's usually the consequences of how you've ordered, let's say, the statements in your transaction. So then you have an option of like reordering your transaction. Whereas wound wait just restarts for internal reasons, right? Say some priority inversion occurs, um, and uh, and in that case, like I mean the the reason read committed is relevant here is because if you were running repeatable read or serializable, you actually expect Postgres to occasionally restart, have to restart transactions um, okay. because that's that's the way the, serial, the SSI and Postgres is implemented. So if, if, you're, if you're assuming SSI, you've already built your application in such a way that it'll restart transactions, but most applications don't do that. Okay, so, um, it's, so it's, it's an app, why, from an application uh, standpoint, you're, you're saying that basically the customers are, the applications are not written assuming that they're going to have to restart. Right, right. And we're right. often in a situation where we're trying to migrate a very complex Postgres application into Citus. So it's it's like that level of change is often uh, too much. So that's where right. kind of wound weight isn't really an option. And deadlock detection is at least gives you the option of, well, the, the deadlock occurs because you did something in opposite order. And so you can hopefully at least maybe change that part of your application, like reorder your update statements. That part I don't think matters because when wait again it's arbitrary when, when you show up. But I think you're basically saying is people you expose that there was a deadlock and then therefore that's a that's a more intuitive to the application developers rather than like this you know technical wound weight definition. Right, right. Yeah, it's it's not okay. like one is technically better than the other. It's just one more Postgres friendly and compatible than the other because Postgres itself also already does yep. deadlock detection. Yep. So it has the okay. exact same semantics. Of yeah, okay, all right, sorry, keep um, going. Yeah, so that, like sometimes we don't, we don't always pick the best technical solution, but the most Postgres compatible solution. <laughs> um, so another thing that's kind of interesting um, in, in uh, inside us, and I'm showing this also because there's like one more important hook that you need to build to turn Postgres into a distributed database, which is the process utility hook uh, or pro process utility hook. Uh, and it, it comes in for anything that's not select, insert, update, and delete. So in select, insert, update, delete, go through the planner, but then everything else goes through this hook. And so one of the commands that goes through there is the copy command. Uh, which in Postgres is just a command to append uh, a CSV input to a table. And because Postgres has a heap format, like the tables are don't have any kind of primary uh, primary index, so everything is, is just stored in an unordered way, appending to the table is actually very fast. Um, it's something that happens with Cyus. So the extension, if it sees a copy command, the extension actually starts reading from the socket. And then it does some like lightweight parsing on the individual rows, tries to figure out the extract the distribution column, pick the shard, and then sends it to the, the workers using the copy protocol as well. And because the copy protocol is asynchronous, uh, so you don't wait for the row to get written, it can immediately do the next row and send that and the next row and send that. So you get a sort of partial parallelization of your 
copy commands as, as well. And that's especially useful when there's a lot of indexes. So you can probably have more indexes and then that way your, your, your reads also get faster. Um, another kind of in interesting command is, is insert select. So uh, especially in real-time analytics use cases, uh, users use this a lot to uh, kind of create roll-up tables or like incremental materialized views where um, you kind of pre-aggregate your data along certain dimensions. And we have kind of, because this is very important to us, we actually have three different implementations of it or three different execution plans for it. So um, one is like, okay, the tables are co-located. So then we can just do the insert select locally between pairs of shards or, or sets of co-located shards rather. Uh, another one is uh, if, the, if they're not co-located, we can do the select part on the shards in a way where each shard produces, uh, or the, the output of each query on the shard produces a set of temporary files uh, that correspond to the destination table. Then we fetch those files to the destination shard and then insert into the destination shard selecting from the files. So this actually also scales pretty well up to the bisection bandwidth of the cluster. And then uh, finally, if, none, if we cannot do either of those things because we need to merge uh, have a merge step in the select, then we will pull the data to the coordinator and actually use copy to write it to the destination table, which again is, is actually pretty fast. So insert select is a bit of a, a superpower in, inside us, uh, at least compared to, uh, compared to Postgres. Um, so I want to do a short, very simple uh, demo just on my uh, local uh, laptop. So I have a... Uh, Three node Citus clusters or two worker nodes. This is the uh, development branch of Citus, though I, I won't do anything too fancy. So to get started, uh, I would create a table, and then uh, I know I, I use this create distributed table function, and I have it set up to actually show what it's sending to the workers. So uh, you can see it's doing uh, the create tables and the create on on each of the workers multiple times for all the shards, and in the end it does this. Uh, prepare transaction, commit prepared. Maybe if I'm fast, I'll see the commit log. Okay, so I can see these, these records that it wrote to remember that it uh, did these prepare transactions. Um, so now I can do, you know, just a, a query on my table and I can see the SQL queries that get sent to the workers. And I can also see the, um, the, the Postgres query plan where uh, this corresponds to the slide I had earlier, where there's this aggregate node on top, which calls into the custom scan, which uses adaptive executor. And that has uh, 32 tasks to do for 32 shards. And this is just showing one of the queries it's, it's going to send to, uh, to the shards. Um, and so I can also do more. Uh, so this is an example of a push downable query where, okay, it has some, some sub query with some joins, some other joins, but in the end, it's actually joining on the distribution column. So by detecting that, we can take this whole subquery and just uh, essentially treat it as a table, but then Postgres on the worker nodes does all the optimizations for uh, the subquery. I can also uh, change this query where it's the same query, but I add this like distribution column filter. Uh, so it'll kind of transitively see, okay, actually both sides of the join have this filter. So I can just uh, send this to uh, a single worker node. Um, other parts are, so let's actually grab some data. Um, so the insert select. So if I just do this type of insert select, uh, I can see it's just, it goes pretty quickly, but uh, here I can see it's actually inserting into the destination shard, just selecting from the source shard. I mean, in this case, it's the same table and this table is implicitly co-located with itself. Um, but then if I, for example, swap that around, it does a whole lot of stuff. Uh, but this is basically the, uh, the repartitioning going on. So it starts with um, this worker partition query result, uh, which runs a SQL query on the shard. And then it has a whole bunch of hash buckets where it writes the results to. Then once it's done doing that, it fetches the buckets to the destination shard and uh, then inserts into the destination shard and reads from these buckets. So all these things like repartitioning are implemented using uh, just function calls that we can include in the SQL queries that, uh, that we send to the workers. And then all of this is also like transactional. So if I 
if I do this and then uh, either like cancel it or abort, we'll just send rollback command. So I can do all this reshuffling in a sort of trans transactional way. So some things we've learned just over, over the years. Um, I guess the first lesson is being an extension is, is a pretty good idea. Um, Postgres uh, has all the extensibility you need to build an entire distributed database system um, in, a, in a very kind of seamless manner as in it, it's very uh, like there's no operation that we cannot cover basically. There's maybe a few very deep down inside, but um, pretty much it's, it's like we've created this whole facade on Postgres that makes it uh, look distributed. Um, now we do find it's very important to make uh, good distribution choices. So to pick your distribution columns well and, and you know, pick your co-location well, but it can be difficult for users. It's like a new uh, skill to learn apart from indexes and other data modeling features. Uh, so what we've done a lot is we've just like helped customers actually uh, onboard on Citus, which is not a very scalable thing to do for, for small uh, customers, but we've noticed over time they uh, they tend to scale out and then it actually gets uh, kind of pays us back. Um, and another thing we learned the hard way is like, I mean, I, we talked a bit about Postgres compatibility and this, this notion of, okay, we, we use that lock detection because it's more compatible. Um, we found it over time, it's very important to look exa at exactly what ORMs are sending to the database because they send a lot of, uh, well, very questionable SQL to the database with, like weird subqueries and, and they use a lot of safe points and unnecessary transaction blocks and, and, and foreign keys, they have a lot of foreign keys. What a lot the of worst? Uh, like what, what's the worst? But what's um, the worst ORM and like what crazy shit do they send you? Uh, well, recently we saw this one which was like doing fairly complicated subqueries in the returning parts of an insert. And I was like, yeah. Okay. Why, why, why? Can, you, uh, can you name names? Uh, well, it is a it is a popular GraphQL ORM. <laughs> Done. Uh, okay. Good. So, um, but yeah, so there, like, it's it's before we actually were were you know addressed all the sort of different things that common ORMs do. It was it was very hard to actually con convert applications from Postgres to Citus. Now that's that's become a lot uh, easier, but you have to also like do all these like little database features that you might not realize are necessary or even exist like uh, cursors and stored procedures and then and, and, uh, different ways of using safe points and, and uh, various other things. So uh, most of our time goes into uh, just solving adoption blockers. So we're not necessarily looking at, okay, what's the most, what's the most interesting technical problem to solve or the most interesting way to solve it, but actually like, what's keeping our customers from from uh, from adopting Citus and also like what what's bugging them in operation. So we're kind of very customer workload focused. And then um, finally, like something we learned the hard way is like we we have to be very prescriptive about uh, about the problem, about the workload we're addressing. Because I think very early on, we started kind of more with a generic, this is scalable Postgres message. But we got a lot, if you remember the Venn diagram, we got, we got a lot of uh, users we're more on the left side of that diagram where they cannot really benefit from scale out, but um, they do have a performance problem. And so that by being a lot more descriptive about, hey, actually, if you have a software as a service, multi-tenant apps, real analytics apps, that's when Citus is a great fit. Um, that also makes it such that if you start helping customers adopt your database, uh, you kind of spend time on the ones that are likely to, uh, to actually be successful. So that's something we kind of just learned uh, the hard way. Um, like some open challenges. Uh, so one thing we started exploring a bit more is this notion of kind of, well, actually having a single server Postgres database is, is pretty good. It can do quite a lot of things uh, and it can run pretty complex OLTP workloads pretty well. So why would we actually even change that? Why, why not just distribute one table if it happens to be big? Um, so this is kind of more of a hybrid model where some table, some tables are still like local to the coordinator and some, some are distributed. Um, so it's kind of an, well, we, it's something we've, we've only just started, uh, doing well, uh, but we're still kind of, okay, then you have all these choices. Do, do I keep this on the coordinator? Do I make this a reference table? Do I make this a distributed table as well? 
So we have to get better at like uh, recommending to users what to do or, or even doing it automatically when, when possible. Um, and the other, uh, another area which is actually quite difficult is picking good uh, roll-ups. So if you look at a dashboard, it often has like some set of queries, let's say 20 queries or 50 queries. And um, the way to make those queries really fast is to by making good materialized views, good roll-ups um, that can, uh, and preferably you make one roll-up for maybe 10 of those queries, but you can easily end up with a situation where your roll-ups are much bigger than your source data. So um, we kind of need an optimizer that can essentially look across query sets or across a set of queries and then decide, okay, this is a good distribution column. This is a good roll-up. So that's kind of a, Open, open challenge. Uh, another interesting one is like PostGIS is quite popular in Postgres. This is almost like a, a fifth workload pattern, but um, often the, like the type of SQL queries that involved in PostGIS applications are, are quite complex, like, or, or just unusual, like distance joins are, are very common. So we're trying to look at how can we, uh, how can we optimize those? And then uh, another interesting area is like nested distributed transactions. So, okay, I send an insert to a shard and that shard has a trigger. Uh, but then if that trigger inserts into another shard, I kind of have like this, this nested transaction and I cannot actually see that insert from the outer transaction. So um, that's something that's, I mean, most maybe a bit Postgres specific or specific to the way we use Postgres, but uh, that's a bit hard to solve. And then there's other things like arbitrary foreign keys and uh, like, Connection scaling is also still somewhat of a challenge because of the process per connection model. Though this is also something we're trying to uh, fix in Postgres itself. Do you, do you guys use PG Bounce in front of that, or is it? Yeah. So um, yeah, Postgres currently is, is especially not great at handling large numbers of idle connections. So it's better to have a PG Bouncer in front of it, and yeah. then. Um, especially is if you that have, you, is that what you guys run? Uh, yes, yeah, we, uh, okay. Use, okay. and then, uh, when you have multiple coordinators, like internally, we use PG bouncers to kind of manage the internal connections. But, um, I mean, PG bouncer can also use some improvements, I guess, because it's sort of single threaded. Um, and so that's, uh, that's all I had. So here's some, some links to, you know, Citus is on you know, GitHub, so you can track all we're doing. Um, also, if you want to get started with, with or you want to try it out, uh, it's easy to set up locally. Uh, you can also, in the Azure portal, if you create go to Azure database for Postgres, uh, there's a hyperscale CITES option. So this allows you to create a, uh, a CITES cluster. Uh, finally, also, there's this uh, quite nice GitHub page that documents all of the hooks in, one, uh, in Postgres in one place. So if you want to build an extension that's uh, Maybe not a good place to start, but definitely a good place to uh, to consult while you're uh, uh, trying to figure out how to hack Postgres. All right. Any okay. Questions? Awesome. So I will applaud on behalf of everyone else. Uh, thank you for doing this. All right. So we'll open the floor to anybody uh, in the audience if you want to ask a question. So unmute yourself again. Say, say who you are, where you're coming from, and ask it. Otherwise, I have a full list. I, I just take the rest of the time. I just have a little bit of, my name, my name is Ling. I'm a PG student here at CMU. Uh, so I just have a little bit high level question, which is, uh, so when uh, Microsoft bought you guys, right, you, you integrated this into Azure, Microsoft Azure CQ. Did you guys did, do, did uh, do additional things like uh, solve additional challenges when you're trying to do that? Or, or you guys already running Azure anyway, so just nothing like, special need to, to need to be done? Um, well, so we had our own uh, managed service as a startup that was uh, built on top of AWS. Um, but like, you know, Azure is a much more uh, complex uh, beast. It's also kind of much more integrated. Like there's, uh, there's let's say one UI to Azure and one, one API. Um, so, I mean, definitely it was quite a lot of work to make uh, the managed service work on Azure. Uh, I mean, ultimately a lot of the underlying uh, logic is, is around auto failover and backups is, is ultimately the same, but um, yeah, so it definitely wasn't uh, sort of an instant thing. Uh, we had already started uh, working on the managed or integrating Citus into Azure before the acquisition. I see, thank you. 
Anybody else? I have one question. Two questions. Do applic does application needs to connect directly to coordinator host or is direct routing to worker node is possible? And second one is, how does reference table data synchronize to all worker nodes? All uh, right, uh, good question. So uh, the first one is like, uh, can you directly connect to the worker nodes? Um, so in general, yes. Um, so like, if I hear uh, for example, so here my worker node is on this uh, port 1301. Uh, so here I just see the shards. Um, also, there is a, an option for um, making the worker node essentially act as a coordinator. And then I actually see the distributed tables on the worker. But then I can also do all the, the queries I normally do uh, on the coordinator from the worker. So um, yeah, and like uh, there, so there's basically these like either your worker is just storing shards or it's also kind of acting as coordinator, but you can uh, you can root queries via the workers. So the second question is, um, how do reference tables get replicated? Um, it's fairly straightforward, like um, just, it just, you know, the statement-based replication. So an insert will go both to both workers in this case and then we'll do a, a two-phase commit. So writes to reference tables, unless you're using copy or uh, generally a bit slower or have at least worse. Uh, there, I mean, there's some locks we take around updates, uh, but yeah, we, we use statement-based replication. Thank you. You mentioned at the beginning of the talk that you are working on integrating column store into the Citus um, Ex extension. Can you talk a little bit about more about your plans with that? Uh, sure. So, uh, so far we've had another extension called C store FDW and, uh, that was like a, a separate extension using the foreign data wrapper API. Um, like currently we're, um, adding it to the site as extension itself. So you can, which uses the access method API. So you can, uh, create a table that uses the columnar access method. And in that case, it's going to be uh, compressed like the C-Store FDW extension does, but it's uh, kind of a bit more evolved. So it, it also supports the replication and that we need for uh, for using it on Citus. But this is uh, it's currently not yet entirely released. So we're, we're still working on that, but uh, it's, it's coming soon. Anybody else? Okay, um, so I guess the my first question would be how do you how do you handle the cases when when functions that produce like serial output uh, I think it like generate series or sequences because uh, you know if I if I call if I call it generate series if you just send that to each node they're all going to generate the the same series but that you know from some exposing a single logical database that underneath the covers is physically partitioned. And that would be incorrect. So, do you special case for things like that, or how do you how do you handle it? Um, yeah. So the, the the place the function gets called is always like a, a little. Um, so this is an interesting area. So I mean, normally if we'd see a generate series in the query, what we do is we do this recursive planning trick. So we'd call it on the coordinator and send the results, uh, broadcast yeah. results, and then do the join. Okay. Um, but there's other cases like. If it's a lateral join, uh, we we wouldn't do that. So if you're using an argument, like you're using one of the uh, the columns from the table as an argument to the function, we pretty much always have to push it down, which is usually actually okay because it's it's kind of semantically correct still. Uh, but it does it does create maybe sometimes unexpected situations that uh, you know you, it's sort of hard to predict whether a function gets called on the worker on the coordinator. But in this particular case. Uh, it would always get called in the in the. Well, what about sequences, right? Because like if I do an insert, like I, I, do you still maintain that global, you know, globally unique counter, or do you do like the cockroach thing where it's like it's globally unique but it's not sequential? Um. Yeah. So if you, I mean, that's one of the advantages of having a um, a, a coordinator would be that you can say I should do black table. Um, serials. Yeah. So then I distribute. Um, 
So let's say I insert into test my values uh, three. So it'll just, you know, this is the, uh, the X big serial. So it, it'll just take from a sequence on the coordinator when it inserts or when we do the copy. Um, but if I was going through the uh, worker node, um, you know, I get, I, get, I get different values. They're much higher. And that's because we put the, uh, the identifier of the worker node into the first 16 bits of the, of the sequence. So sort of globally unique still, but not, not incrementing yet. And then if I do a select on that table now, not going through the, the worker node, do I, do I see, do I see the, the appended one or do I see? Okay. Yeah, so if you if you do an insert via worker node, it would it would generate a uh, a weird sequence value, but still globally unique. But if you're always connecting via one coordinator, then you don't have that uh, issue. Okay. Okay. And you and, you, and you're smart enough to like it just you're just updating the sequence on the coordinator, which is just a counter, and not like actually materializing it the insert into the table. Uh, right. Right. Yeah. I mean, okay. we're okay. we're basically putting it into. Uh, in, into the actual SQL command that we send to the coordinator after. Got it, got it. Okay, um, okay, so then my next question is sort of more broader things. Um, again, as, as a Postgres extension, sort of, like, you know, I asked about generative series, I asked about sequences. Um, how would you, whether, you've not, whether or not you've done this, but how would you quantify sort of your compatibility or, or your coverage of Postgres in the, you know, under distributed operation with Citus? Like, I'm sure there's like weird queries you've never seen before, but is there, have you guys ever had a way to quantify that? Um, yeah, I mean, there's, I guess, specific SQL constructs, um, probably like usual suspects, like non, -co like correlated subqueries that do a non-collocated joins. I mean, we support almost anything as long as the, the collocated join is in there. We support basically everything as long as the distribution column filter is in there. So it kind of goes through these stages. Uh, but if there's like, it's across shards, non-collocated joins, uh, yeah, then there's like uh, limitations around uh, subqueries, especially. Um, so yeah, we, we don't- I guess what, what I'm getting is, I wonder if there's an automated way to take like the grammar file from mm -hmm. the parser. And be able to say, I mean, yeah, there's built-in functions in UDF that like that one, they're not going to be parsed correctly, but like there's a way to take the grammar file. We cover of all the keywords in the Postgres SQL dialect, like what percentage we cover it. But I guess it's, it's tied to the data too. So it's, it's tough to say. Yeah, yeah. Because it's sort of specific to distribution and Postgres of like yeah. maybe zones. If you're in this zone, we support anything. If you're in this other zone, we don't support everything. Uh, you, you'd probably have to come up with some tool that, uh, well, that's, that's in the end, pretty site is specific. Yeah. But, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, so I, I have a qualitative description, but we don't have really a sort of model of it um, right now. That's fair. All right. So my last question is a more of a question about like the Postgres, distributed Postgres market. Um, now you're biased, obviously, it's a site with you know, the successful acquisition. But I wonder if you could comment on like, what, what made Citus be the one that succeeded, right? Because you're not the first person to try to do distributed Postgres, right? There was Postgres XC, Postgres XL, Trans Lattice guys, right? Like, what was it about that you think that Citus did right that made you guys the one that, like, you know, outlived the rest? Uh, that's a very good question. It's, um, I, don't, I don't know why, if I have the answer, but some, some reasons I can sort of propose is... Um, uh, and it being extension was definitely uh, you know, sort of a, a secret weapon. Like every every year, our, our product would just magically get better because there'd be a new Postgres release. Um, and uh, I think like the the burden of being a fork is just ultimately too high. So um, I mean, but I don't think like being an extension is a is a sufficient condition to succeed. Um, I mean, there's there's an amount of um, luck involved of being in the right place in the right time, like having the right set of investors. Like we went through Y Combinator, that kind of gives you a pretty good starting point. Um, and then 
I think we also had a sort of very specific customer focus, which allowed us to actually uh, win customers early on. And, and for those, it, uh, what's especially important there is that you, I mean, it doesn't matter how much they pay, but you have to learn from them. Like what, what are they actually doing? And uh, so we, we try to focus on that. And then it kind of becomes this, this flywheel where you can keep uh, converting more customers because you're applying what you learned from your previous customer. So that's definitely also a factor. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, there's some, some amount of luck involved, I guess, but on the technical front, I think uh, being an extension is, has just been our, our, our superpower essentially that uh, has where, where other projects have, have failed or, or just really struggling to keep up. Uh, we, we never had that overhead. Like if a new Postgres release comes out, okay. I mean, it does take us like two or three weeks of engineering to, uh, you know, all the headers have changed. All the, the signatures of the functions have changed. We end up with a bunch of if def statements in our C code, but still it's, it's okay. Like not, not the whole database changed. So, and we don't yeah. really have to worry about, uh, okay. Now, now Postgres has a different write ahead log or something like it. It, it doesn't matter to, uh, to the extension. That's awesome. All right. So Marco. It's late for you. Thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it.